Uh, so I'm genuinely delighted, uh, firstly, to uh, welcome you all here to the RSM. Um, uh, it's a huge pleasure to be um, introducing my last National Audit Project. Um, uh, but it's, no, it's, a, it's a huge pleasure to be introducing uh, NAP6, uh, looking at uh, life-threatening perioperative anaphylaxis. Um, I'm required as chair to start with a few formal announcements. There are no emergency procedures today. Uh, in case of a fire, uh, please leave by the nearest exit, which I presume is out in that direction. Uh, members of the uh, Royal Society of Medicine will be taking photos today. If you do not appear, wish to appear in photos, cover your face or let people know you're taking photos that you don't wish to be in them, please. Uh, mobiles are silent. Feel free to tweet. Um, uh, Wi-Fi, I'm asked to read out the Wi-Fi. I'm not going to. Uh, there's a prize for anybody who can log on without making a mistake first time. Um, and we'll crack on. It's a busy day. There are a lot of um, talks to get through. The talks are brief. Uh, we're covering a 240-page document which has uh, taken four years uh, to produce. Uh, and so the talks are brief and pretty much pithy. Um, there's lots more in the document than you'll hear in the, in the, in the presentations. Before I introduce uh, Liam, um, I would uh, like to say a few thanks. I think it's really important I do thank people. Liam will also thank people, and there may be a little bit of overlap. Um, at the college, I'd particularly like to thank Laura. Would you like to stand up, Laura? Um, I won't... I won't I I won't make anybody else stand up, but Laura has been uh, sort of the bedrock of the, of the project, the coordinator at the college, and has done a huge amount of work. We didn't have Laura at the start, and the start of the project wasn't perfect, but it has been since Laura's been here. Everything she's done has been perfect. Uh, James Goodwin, Jose Lurte, Dimitri Papadimitru, uh, Mandy Kelly, Gavin Dallas and his communications team, Sharon Drake at the college, have all done a fantastic job. And, uh, the college has always provided fantastic support for these national audit projects, and I'm hugely grateful um, for that, uh, as you should be. Uh, Martin Shields. Martin, would you stand up? I don't know. Martin, who's been our moderator, um, who uh, many of you may have contacted about these, about these uh, cases before reporting to us. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I'd like to thank also Jana Varsh and uh, Caroline Leach, who are patient representatives um, and Jan will be speaking a little bit later, and Caroline, I think, will be appearing on television a little bit later. And we thank you very much for, for your time and, uh, and your um, bravery in telling us your stories, actually. I, of course, would like to thank every single uh, person who's contributed uh, to the project, and that's every anaesthetist, particularly the local coordinators, but I'll leave that principally to Liam and, of course, uh, every allergist and immunologist. And lastly, um, my particular thanks to Nigel, who's led the project, and to the panel of 25, who I'm not going to mention, but many of whom will be speaking, uh, who have done enormous amounts of work. Right, enough. Uh, so, already a little, bit a little bit behind before I even ask Liam to come up. Uh, so Liam's the president of the college. Uh, Dr Liam Brennan, I'd, uh, I'd invite you to uh, introduce the day. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much, Tim. So, as Tim has said, my name is Liam Brennan. I'm president of the Royal College of Anaesthetists, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the sixth national audit project, NAP6, focused on perioperative anaphylaxis. The publication of a NAP report is always uh, a watershed moment for anaesthesia, both in the UK and increasingly internationally, uh, and uh, it challenges the way we think about rare but serious complications in our specialty. NAP6, like each of its uh, predecessors, provides reassurance for anaesthetists on those areas where our practice is successful, but also identifies where there is room for improvement and questions our preconceived ideas about managing these challenging clinical scenarios. So we have a great programme for you uh, today, but before we get started, um, a few additional thanks from me. Thank you firstly to our colleagues here at the RSM for allowing us to use their uh, wonderful facilities uh, for today's event and for making sure the sun is shining. Uh, to all the NAP6 local coordinators, and many of you are here, here today, I'm delighted to see that, who reported on each case of perioptive anaphylaxis in their hospitals across the year of data collection and ensuring, uh, which I think is a fantastic tribute to our specialty, that there's 100% compliance of all NHS hospitals taking part. 
I think that is a, a wonderful uh, um, uh, accolade to all of you uh, individually and on behalf of the college and the specialty. I should also thank every anaesthetist and allergist uh, 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 who completed a NAPSIC survey for one of these cases. The openness and engagement uh, shown by the clinical community with each NAP is immensely gratifying and a great credit to all concerned. And a particular thanks to all colleagues in the independent health, in, 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 in independent health care, as NAPSIC is the first of our projects to engage uh, with the independent sector. We should also reiterate our thanks to uh, Laura Farmer. Uh, it really doesn't happen, and she really has pulled it together uh, and kept everybody in line, including uh, Nigel and Tim. Uh, and finally, I should thank formally uh, uh, both uh, Professor Nigel Harper and uh, as clinical lead for the project, and uh, Tim Cook as director of the NAP programme, uh, and all the anaesthetists, allergists, and immunologists, and lay representatives of the multidisciplinary NAPSIC steering panel. Uh, the commitment of this group in designing the audit and analysing the hundreds of uh, reported cases really shouldn't be underestimated. It's been a huge task. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Baroness Elora Finley of Clandaff. Elora is a crossbench peer, deputy speaker of the House of Lords, and a former president of the RSM. So it's, it's her house we're in today. And an old friend of the college uh, and our specialty, with a range of uh, interests and expertise arising from her clinical career as a palliative care physician. So she really does understand our world. But in relation to the publication of this report, her engagement stems primarily from having been a member of the 2007 House of Lords Science and Technology Committee inquiry into allergy. So Elora, thank you for joining us and setting the scene for what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm going to tell you briefly about the <coughs> allergy committee inquiry that I chaired, uh, and I'm going to tell it you warts and all, because it was very, very interesting, and it's great to see some of the people here who gave evidence to our inquiry. Please note the date, just over 10 years old, and I think it's interesting that it often takes 10 years before you really begin to see things happening which is that sort of lag period that we all uh, despair about. Our challenge actually was to say what allergy is and what it isn't, and explain how serious it can be, that it isn't something trivial at all, but also how little we know. And there was a lot in the press at the time around peanuts, um, so that was quite a good hook, really, to get permission to run the select committee inquiry. And we also wanted to look at how the UK compared with the EU. Um, and I guess you can probably imagine how we did. Uh, so first of all, we're trying to explain in the report the complexity of allergy. And this is our simplified diagram to try to get that message across. Actually, it, in the report, we weren't able to use as many colors in, as in this. Uh, but I just draw your attention, really, to the bit that, I, that I've put in red, because that's really what we're talking about today. But to try to explain the science behind it to people, to the lay and, and um, to policymakers, is actually really difficult. And, of course, the different manifestations uh, that run through, and the one underlined is obviously what you're addressing today, but the concepts of multiple allergies and what is allergy and what isn't, so so-called oral allergy syndrome, which is a hypersensitivity but not really a true allergy, and so on. Um, and we tried to explain with diagrams what happens. I had a huge battle to get diagrams in this report, but I do think that's better than any descriptor to try to get people to understand what can happen. Um, and when we looked at the different allergic mechanisms and manifestations, um, we tried to represent them again a bit diagrammatically and help people understand that food intolerance was different to allergies. And also this idiopathic environmental sensitivity 
label that really didn't seem to fit in to an allergic mechanism. So we looked at where does the consultation happen, and of course it was all over the place really. You could say allergy is ubiquitous in terms of its presentation, from very mild to extremely scary. Um, and I'm sure that just about everyone in this room is familiar with this um, paper, which I, I've downloaded the pictures from, uh, which has come out obviously much more recently. This, I think, is 2014. Uh, but we were really struck, actually, at, uh, on the committee at the haphazard nature of allergy testing. And I would include in that what you could call so-called allergy testing because there were various allergy testing kits that people could buy on the internet. Um, and of course, people selling them beat a path to our door. I um, agreed to get, um, have a blood sample of mine taken and sent off. And of course, the results came back that I was allergic to just about everything I currently eat. And of course, wasn't to everything that I don't eat. I mean, it was talk about creating food fads and at high cost and so on. It was really quite worrying, actually, um, that these things go on rather than proper allergy testing, which needs to happen. <clears throat> so we also uh, encountered uh, even more people than this, but these are the main clinical specialties that deal with allergies of some sort as their kind of bread and butter. And of course, there's general practice as well. Um, but these seem to be the, the main groups of people in secondary care. Um, I would have to say, as we started the inquiry, I got really concerned at the tension that seemed to exist between allergists and immunologists. Because coming from outside, <laughs> One couldn't understand it at all. Um, and the problem of trying to get people to work together, I think, seemed to be our big strategic landmark that we had to try to achieve. So what did we come out with as our key recommendations? And this was after we'd been at uh, two different centres in the UK and we'd also been across in Europe. And I'd have to say we were very impressed with Germany and the way that they had um, managed to organise their services. So we wanted to recommend that there should or there must be in every strategic health authority an allergy centre led by an allergist or a clinical immunologist. It really didn't matter, but have the label allergist because then people would know what they were referring to. Uh, with really good diagnostic facilities, with a responsibility for education, training, and providing information, information out to patients as well. And that's not just leaflets. Leaflets are often pretty useless at providing information, and people bin them, or else they read every line so meticulously that you begin to worry if it's slightly OCD. But uh, leaf, and some people, of course, can't read well. Um, and so we really hope that these would run much more sort of discussion group, interaction groups and so on. And now that IT has come along and changed hugely in the 10 years since we were doing this, um, I think that there is even more of a place for using little video clips, these little kind of portable um, computer books that are not very expensive but can have lots of information on them with video clips for people of all ages to follow and so on. There's a lot that can be done. And we felt that it needs to be a hub and spokes model in order to outreach appropriately. So this would be a center linking out, but also uh, that some of these for the very rare allergies would need to be national reference centers. So as well as having these allergy centers they would all cross-link across the country, and then some would be national reference centres for different types of activities. And we envisaged one becoming the National Reference Centre for Anaesthetics. Now, of course, this was all pre-Lansley. 
uh, and nobody envisaged the change in the NHS coming along with NHS England and the way that it's all, I would have to say, I think, been thrown up in the air a bit. So some of these recommendations, just as they're written, uh, might appear to fall by the wayside, but actually I think the principles behind them still hold good. So the allergy centre would be the place to be able to deal with really complex allergies and bring together all these different people with a different involvement. So clinical immunology has a huge place in there, uh, but chest medicine has a bit less. ENT, ophthalmology, really less, which is why some of the bubbles are more in than out. But they would all be contributing, and we'd hope that they would all get together. A GP would be able to refer in, particularly in somebody who had several manifestations of allergy, because we kept on coming across stories that will be very familiar to you of one patient seeing a handful of different specialties, often being given conflicting advice, or it might feel conflicting to the patient, and each bit of their manifestation of allergy seems to be in a silo with one discipline that doesn't talk to the silo of the other discipline. So it was really to break that down, and we had hoped that they would have co even collaborative parallel outpatient clinics so somebody could pop across the corridor easily. Um, of course, the commissioning model in England mitigates against that a bit now because of the way money flows. Uh, we felt it was really important for there to be professional education, obviously, and wanted the Royal Colleges to work with the postgraduate deans and develop guidelines. Fantastic that you're actually 10 years on launching something which fits with this vision. It's really, really um, heartwarming, actually, because I, you do worry when you're chairing a committee like this that your report will just gather dust. So we wanted to empower primary care by having good links between the centre and primary care to deal with things but be able to fast track refer back in and uh, to have really good testing and good desensitisation and immunotherapy conducted in an environment which is safe. And that was where we were particularly impressed with the facilities that we saw in Germany. Uh, we were very keen on R&D uh, to look at environmental factors, cohort studies. At the time we did the inquiry, um, the concern about diesel particulates and pollen uh, was emerging in Germany but was being somewhat poo-pooed in the UK. I would have to say the evidence we came across in the inquiry was enough, enough to make me decide that I would never buy a diesel car. Um, something which car salesmen didn't understand five years ago. Uh, but, I, but I really got worried about diesel particulates from what we were hearing then, and uh, it became clear that they, they would probably have other um, interactions with our own biology. And obviously we wanted to promote translational research. We felt it was very important to have a register to know the size of the problem of each manifestation of allergy. Um, and uh, looking at food, uh, we strongly uh, supported the LEAP study uh, that was going on from the Evelina at the time. They were trying to get funding, and we strongly supported that. And, of course, the LEAP study has come through to demonstrate um, low level of peanut uh, desensitization and, and carrying on with that and the importance of it. Uh, with schools, we were worried about schools not having EpiPens, and it's only been, I think, in the last two years that we've managed to get through regulations that allow schools to hold a spare EpiPen, because uh, we're all aware of children who forget their school bag, forget the contents of it, uh, lose it, mislay it, or it's not there when it's needed. It's not where it needs to be. Um, and we were concerned about exams being in the hay fever season. So there were other things as well, and I just put these up to show you the breadth of the recommendations we made. 
and we'd hope for a pilot centre probably in the northwest, the joint committee, uh, and to build allergy service expertise to begin to match Germany. We also stress the importance of patient groups and that they should link together and take a strategic overview. And we're hopeful that if the patient groups could come together, if allergists and immunologists could come together, that could actually create a really strong single voice to argue for resources. And just to be a bit provocative, I would suggest that if that doesn't happen, you may find as money gets tighter and tighter, which it's inevitably going to be, that resources shrink rather than expand over time. Um, so that was our report. That's how we approached it. And 10 years on, it's just wonderful to see that something is happening and coming through to fruition, um, and that it wasn't just a report that's gathered dust. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Baroness Finlay. And it's a, it is really a, an honour to have you here opening our uh, day today. Um, so we're going to cut to the chase now. And Nigel, um, so the boss of the project, is going to uh, give an overview. Uh, so in only about, I think it's 15 minutes, is going to talk through uh, the whole of the project. Um, and then we'll go back and talk through things in, in considerably more detail over the next few hours. Uh, so Nigel is... Uh, Mr. Mr. Anesthesia Allergy UK, uh, previously an anaesthetist in uh, Manchester, and professor uh, in the university there, and um, has led the project for the last four years. Thanks, Nigel, very much.